king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? <laughs> my king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the lostest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent and he purifies the weak. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't have him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Jesus Christ. 
Christ, and He is who He says He is. Amen? Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Do you believe it today? Yes. You believe He's all these things this man is saying up here? Yes. Hallelujah. All right, Psalm 146 says, Praise the Lord. Let all that I am praise the Lord. Is that you this morning? When you were worshiping God, when you were singing these songs, is that what you were telling yourself? Let all that I am. So, it's time to praise the Lord. Amen. Amen? Sometimes we have to command ourselves and say, you know what? You're going to praise the Lord, whether you like it or not. Right. Right. All right? So, praise the Lord. Let all that I am praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God with my dying breath. God. Don't put your confidence in powerful people. There is no help for you there. When they breathe their last, they return to the earth and all their plans die with them. But joyful are those who have the God of Israel as their helper, Amen. whose hope is in the Lord their God. Listen, He made heaven and earth to see in everything that is in them. He keeps every promise forever. He gives justice to the oppressed and food to the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are weighed down. The Lord loves the godly. The Lord protects the foreigners among us. He cares for the orphans and widows. But He frustrates the plans of the wicked. The Lord will reign forever. That's what you know. I don't care what anybody says on this earth. The Lord will reign forever. Amen? He will be your God, O Jerusalem, and the people that have been grafted in. Amen? Throughout the generations, praise the Lord. Oh, glory to God. See, this is the God we serve. This is the God we serve. This is the God that we, as Christian people, at South of the Day of Salvation, said, Hey, I'm going to put my hope in this God. I want you to journey back to that day. Well, maybe it wasn't a specific day of salvation, but maybe you got saved even as a young child. We were talking about this in our class this morning. And maybe you had that aha moment where Jesus really became real in your life. And it was like, wow, Jesus is who he says he is. This is, this is awesome. It's now, it's, I'm now in a relationship with my Savior. And man, he's changing my perspective on life. See, I want us to understand, when we have that aha moment, it changes the whole, our whole perspective. When we place our hope in the God that we just read about and we just heard about. That's who He is. Now, I'll admit, there's, there's times in my life and in my Christian walk where there's days where I forget that. You ever get there? Where you forget that. And you, you begin to lose that hope that you once had. Well, I want you, I want you to understand this. When we get through here this morning, you're going to realize you're not the only person that goes through that. But I also want you to understand that, you know what? I want to make, the Holy Spirit wants to make you aware of it today so that you can respond differently in the future. Amen? Are you ready to walk this journey with me this morning? I'm ready. <clears throat> First of all, blessed are those who hope in the Lord. Okay? First, I want, I want to understand what hope is. In Romans chapter 8, verse 24, it says, We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, listen, if we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. Okay? There's no reason to say, I hope Becca's in church this morning. Because Becca's sitting right there. Right? Okay, there's no reason for me to hope for that. Because she's here. So, we don't need to hope for it. But it's the things that we can't see. It's the things that we're praying for, right? And I know those are the things that discourage us the most because we, we look and we see, oh, this isn't happening, so we lose hope. Now, I want us to understand something. In that moment, I want you to understand what you're placing your hope in. You know what you're placing your hope in? Your circumstances and your situations. And when those circumstances and situations don't end up the way that you thought they should end up, guess what happens? You get discouraged and distraught. So we need to we need to change that. When we get in that place of hopelessness, what we need to we need to first question ourselves. Where is my hope right now? 
Is my hope in Jesus Christ who never changes? Is my hope in the one that's the same yesterday, today, and forever? Or is my hope in what I expected and didn't happen? Because I want you to understand, I know people say, well, you know, why does God do this? Or why does God allow this to happen? You know what? God's never let me down. He's just done it His way. And I know it's the best. Amen? Amen. All right. Hope. Okay, verse, verse 25. But we look forward to something that we, we don't yet have. We must wait, what? Patiently and confidently. Okay, it's not just the patience and just being like, oh, I'm just going to wait over here. No, it's like, you know what? I'm waiting here and I'm expecting something to happen. Okay, I am confident that what I pray for is going to come to pass. Amen? So I'm not just sitting there waiting on God. No, I'm confidently expecting something to happen in my life. Hope. A feeling of expectation. Okay? I don't even like that word feeling. Because there are going to be times you aren't going to feel it. Okay? But you still need to expect it. Okay? Alright? So don't just, don't just put, put, all, put all your feelings. Because if you, if you go through your spiritual life... Depending on your feelings, you're going to be down more than you're up. All right? We can't put our hope in our feelings. Because our feelings are going to tell us, they're going to lie to us at times. Right? So we must come to the place that we have hope in the one who is able to do what we need to happen. Okay, now I want don't don't get your expectation. Ah, oh, it's going to happen just like this. Because when it doesn't happen like that, and he does it his way, yeah. you know what's going to happen? Oh man, because you put your hope in your expectation. Put your hope in Jesus Christ. Right. My hope is in Jesus Christ, and however He wants to see this plan out, God, my hope is in You. So I trust You. So our hope is in God and in Him alone, and not, nothing else. Nothing in this world. No person. You ever try to put your hope in a person and they let you down? I'm telling you. You can't trust people on this earth. Now I know, well, well I trust my wife. Trust my, that's great. That's wonderful. But you know what? I'm going to let my wife down. She's going to let me down. But you know what? You know who's never going to let me down? Jesus. As long as I'm putting my hope in Him and trusting His will and His purpose. <clears throat> All right. Are you ready? We're going to get into a man that hope with, most of us will probably be able to bear witness with. Turn to Judges chapter 6 this morning. Judges chapter 6. <clears throat> Judges chapter 6. This is a man by the name of Gideon. Many of you people know this man, but he's, he's famously known for the fleece. Right? Everybody remembers the fleece story. Oh man, Gideon just didn't have no faith, so he had to put out a fleece. Right? Maybe nobody says that because they're like, I put out fleeces all the time. I want to know, make sure it's God. Right? <clears throat> well, this is the fleece. This, this is, there's a lot more to the story of Gideon than just the fleece. I want to start out in verse 12 today, where it says, The angel of the Lord came and sat on the terebinth tree, which was in Or, or I'm sorry, I'm in 11, Orphath, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Okay, now if you if you were to read further and you were to kind of get a, um, an idea of who Gideon was, when the angel approached him and said, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor, you probably would have looked at you. This is what Gideon probably would have looked like. Where's he at? Who you talking to? Because he didn't look at, it, at himself like that. Okay, he didn't believe that he was that person. Okay, I want you to understand something. Sir, there's, God, is, God has spoken things over your life. God has said, this is who you are. And you know what? Some of us, when, when God addresses us 
as a child of the king, where God addresses us as a mighty man or a woman of valor, you know what we do? We look around like, where? Where are they at? No, that's you. That's you. You see, so, so often we've, we've, we believe the lies of what people tell us we are. That's right. See, this is all part of hope. We can't believe the lies of what people are telling us we are. We have to believe what Jesus Christ has already declared us to be. We have to believe what God has already spoken over our lives. Do you know that you're fearfully and wonderfully made today? Do you? The Bible declares it. I don't care if you believe it or not. It's true. You are fearfully and wonderfully made in this place. You know, I'm going to put my hope in that. I'm going to say, you know what, no matter what somebody comes and says, man, you're, you need a bag, man. Because you don't look good. Hey, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. This is how God made me, and I'm, I'm thankful for it. Yeah. Right? What? Maybe people are saying, man, you need a bag over your heart because that's ugly. <laughs> well, that comes through repentance. <laughs> Amen? Amen. But you see Gideon, and then Gideon said to him, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, now listen to this. Come on. This is where we're all going to be able to bear witness. Okay, because he just said, The Lord is with you, Almighty Man of Valor. Now here's Gideon's response. Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? <laughs> Ain't nobody ever said that. <laughs> okay, let's, let's read on here. And where are all of his miracles which our fathers told us about? Saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? And now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Yeah, I've read this Bible, but I don't see it happening today. Right? Isn't that what Gideon's saying? I read about the Egyptians. I heard the stories, but I don't see it happening right now, Lord. It was all great and fine that you delivered them from Egypt, but what about us? We're captured by the Midianites, and here we are. Do you care? You say you're with us, but look at our circumstances. Hmm. I know some of us, you know, we, we, we get that attitude. God, you know, you say you're with me. You say you care. But where are you at? God, I've been going through this for months now. Where are you? Well, I'm here to tell you he's right here. He's right here. He hasn't let you down. You may be looking at your, at, like I said, looking at your circumstances and situations, and you may be saying, where's God? And God's saying, where's your hope? Where's your hope? Is it in me? Or is, is it in what you're seeing? See, you're looking around, and you're seeing hopelessness. But when you start to redirect your eyes and put them back on me, you'll start to see hope again. That's what God wants us to do. So Gideon, now I, I, I'm saying this is this is where this is where Gideon was. He was discouraged, like many of us get, right? He was discouraged, like man, if you're with me, where are you at? You know, I, I I've heard about what you've done done in the days of old, but what about today? And God's saying, hey, I'm your hope. I'm here. But I love this because this is Gideon, you know, God always responds and he, 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 puts, he puts some responsibility on our lives. He says, hey, you know what? I'm, I've always been the same. I'm not the one who's changed here, right? God is saying, I'm not the one who's changed here. And he says this, then the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? You want to know Gideon why? You want to know Gideon why you, you don't see any deliverance? Because you're not doing what you're supposed to do. You put your hope in the wrong things. If you to put your hope in me, you'd understood that I have called you to go against the Midianites. Ooh. What is God telling you today? Maybe you're like, God, I just don't see you. What are you doing? He's like, I'm waiting for you to do something. I'm waiting for you to move. I'm waiting for you to do what I've called you to do. Because your hope is in me. See, when our hope is in our situation, our circumstance, we won't pay attention to what God is wanting to do. 
Because we're so caught up in our own discouragement and our own struggle that we can't see God. And we can't see what He desires us to do anymore. So, as many of us, when God puts that responsibility on us, this is our response. So He said to him, Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Some of ours may look like, oh Lord, God, you know, God, I hate public speaking. Lord, I, no way, you know, no God, you can't become, I'm a horrible teacher. God, no, I, God, no. Man, I, I, just, I just have a hard time ministering to people like that. You know, I don't know what, I don't know what the catch is, but all of us have got a catch. There's all of us have got a reason why we're not doing what God is calling us to do. Right? We've all got a reason. But you know what? God didn't take Gideon's reason and say, you know what, you're right, Gideon. What? I was, I got the wrong address. I'll go to the guy down the street. That's who I was looking for. <laughs> That's not what God does. Okay, God knows your address, he knows your name, and he knows who he's coming to when he wants something done. Amen? All right. So, he says this, he says, the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you. Now the question is, is that enough for you? Is that enough for me? The Lord said, he said, the Lord will be with you. Is that enough? For you to step out in faith and place your hope in Jesus Christ and say, I can do this because of him. Is that enough? Is it enough that the Lord is with you today? Because the Lord is with you. He said, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. I, want to, I don't know if many of you uh, saw the sign coming in this morning. I want to explain it if you didn't understand it. But it said, one man with God is the majority. You understand that? One man with God is the majority. Okay, you may have a thousand people coming against you, but if you're one man and you're standing on his truth, you're the majority. Okay? It doesn't matter. One man with God is the majority. God is showing Gideon what he's talking about. One man with God is the majority, Gideon. Me with you. We can go defeat these Midianites. We, we say that. Oh, God. God, you just don't know. We try to, we try to explain God how bad our struggle is. How difficult our struggle is. Right? We, just, we try to lay it all out for him like he doesn't know. Right? <laughs> I'm guilty of it. God, do you see this? Do you see what's going on here? Because I really need some help right now. <clears throat> says, then he said to him, this is Gideon speaking. If he, then he said to him, If I have now found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that if it is you who talk to me. This is Gideon saying, Hey, God, I really need to know that this is you. I know, you know, this guy says he's an angel, but you know, I'm not really buying it today, okay? Um, so could you please show me a sign uh, that this is you? And so, so the angel of the Lord, he tells him, Go, go prepare an, an offering. And so he brings this offering out to, out to the angel of the Lord and the angel of the Lord says, here, put, put it on this rock right here. And he puts it on this rock, and the angel of the Lord touches the rock with the, a with the stick, and it consumes the sacrifice. Consumes it right up out of the rock. The fire just comes out of the rock and consumes it, just like that. So Gideon's kind of starting to understand, you know, that maybe this is God. It says, now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. That's what it says. His perception changed, right? His perception changed. He no, he no longer thought, oh, you know, this guy, he's, he might be the angel, he might not. But he perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, we're in verse 22, if you're wondering. Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Then the Lord said to him, peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Peace be with you. Do not do. You shall not die. I want you to personalize these words this morning. If you're going through a struggle, 
you're going through difficulty, it feels like it's been years since you've seen the light of day. I want you to understand this is the Lord speaking to you this morning. Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. This is the Lord speaking to you. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. The Lord is Peace. You remember those times where you... you you get in the presence of Jesus Christ. You get in the presence of the Lord. And right there, He speaks to you. And He says, it's all going to be okay. And then some of us, maybe you can remember that peace that overwhelms your soul. And you thought, wow, this is amazing. This peace is something I've never experienced before. And maybe, I'm sure you didn't go as far as getting into building an altar and call it the Lord is peace. But maybe but you remember that moment when he gave you peace and it was so overwhelming. <clears throat> and Gideon never veered away from believing God again. Because he had this moment. Yeah, right. Let's read really on. <laughs> All right. Okay, so it says in... <clears throat> Then the Bible says in verse 25, it says, Now it came to pass that same night the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it. And build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock. In the proper arrangement, take the second bull and offer a burnt, burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men from among his servants and did as the Lord had said to him. Now listen to this. But because he feared his father's household and the man in the city too, much to do it by day, he did it by night. He just experienced, had this experience of peace and fear is already gripped in the room. Now did he go ahead and do what he was supposed to do? Yeah, he just did it at night instead of during the day. Right? He went down and tore down these, these altars of Baal. He went down and tore them down and he, he yanked them down and he did it at night. And then the people woke up the next morning and they were, they were irate. Saying, who did this? We're going to put this man to death. Well, this man needs to die. Right? And so they went to Joash, who was Gideon's father. And he said, bring out your son that he may die because he has torn the altar of Baal. And because he has cut down the wind image that was beside it. But Joash said to those who stood against him, listen to this. Would you plead for Baal? Would you save him? Let the one who would plead for him be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him plead for himself. If he is a god, let him plead for himself. Isn't that awesome? Because his altar has been torn down. So, the people, that really speaks to the people and they don't, they don't kill him. And it says, But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon when he blew the trumpet, and the Abizarites gathered behind him. So, but Gideon still isn't sold on this whole fact that he's supposed to lead this great army into victory. Okay? So, here we are, verse 36. It says, So Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. Now listen, you know, that is that... You come to God, God, if you will do this as you have said. God, I really don't believe what you're saying, but if you will do this. <laughs> right? Now, I want, us, I want us to really understand this because God still chose to use Gideon. Okay, there may be times in our walk where we have these moments of doubt and we have these, God, if this is really what you want, even though you've already heard that's what he wants, God will still use you. Okay, don't think that he's just throwing you out and saying, well, you didn't do it that one time, so I can't use you anymore. That's not what he does. Okay, Gideon didn't jump on board at that moment, but he's, he's given Gideon another chance. Okay, he said, look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only, and it is dry on the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand. Did you hear that? He's going to put fleece on the threshing floor. And if it's got dew on it, and it's dry all around it, he's going to believe that God has spoken to him. Okay? 
Well, getting wakes up this morning is just as he asked God to do it. Hey, I'm so God, I'm I believe. No. Okay, God, if this is really you, if this is really you, God, then I know you can do this too. This time I'm going to put my fleece out. And I want my fleece to be dry. But I want all the ground around it to be wet. Mm. Okay? So Gideon wakes up the next morning. What happens? Exactly what God said would happen. Or exactly what Gideon prayed for. That's exactly what God did. And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on all the ground. You see, God knows when we need a little boost of faith, a little boost of hope in our spirits. Gideon needed that boost. And Gideon hadn't quite figured out that, hey, God is a God. God he hadn't quite figured out who God was. Or who, he didn't know the God that we heard about this morning. Right? He had only heard of the God that he had heard about. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, there's a God that we hear about, and there's a God that we know. Okay, he had heard about a God that delivered the, the children of Israel from Egypt. But you know what? He didn't know that God. Okay, maybe, you, maybe you're here this morning, and you heard a lot about a God that is faithful and holy and, and has and can do all these things, and he is this God that we've, that we've read about and spoke about this morning. But you don't know the God that we've read about and spoke about this morning. There's a difference. I heard about God all my life, but I didn't know Him. See, Gideon is going from hearing about Him to knowing Him. And that's where we all have to trace, that's where we all have to cross over to. From hearing about him and hearing all the great stories about all. So many of us were raised in church. We sat in Sunday school. We know all the stories. They're great. But we just heard about a God that can do that. I've never got to know him like I need to. Some people may be thinking this isn't relevant. Pastor, we're all believers here. You know what? It doesn't matter. You, you know you can cross back over to the place of just hearing about him, too? You can cross back over to that place. And you can find yourself in that place of, well, I've heard about God, I've heard about God, but I don't know him anymore. We don't want to, we don't want ourselves, we don't want to find ourselves in that position. Verse in chapter 7. Let's continue reading. I'm kind of going off my notes, but you know what? God's got better stuff to say than what I put on my notes in anything. So. Here we go. Then Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him, rose early and camped beside the well of Herod. So the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, listen to this. The Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Hmm. See, that this is what I love about God. Okay? God has proven himself to Gideon. He's shown him that, hey, this is who I am. This is who I am. I am a God that you can place your hope in. I am a God that you can trust. I am a God that you can believe. And then, and then he drops the bomb. He's like, all right, you got your hope in me, you got your trust in me. Now, I want you to understand, you got way too many people here. <laughs> Wait a minute, God, what you talking about? I just brought enough, God, so that we could defeat him and it would be, be great. It would be done. I said, nope, too many. Because, see, if, if you defeat him with all these people, you know what you're going to do? You're going to say, yeah, yeah, we did this. We did this. We defeated the Midianites. And God said, that ain't going to work for me. That ain't going to work for me. Because if you're not willing to give me the glory, then you ain't going to defeat many of us. So, this was the first separation. God says, now therefore proclaim the hearing of the people. Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people turn, return and 10,000 remain. Did you hear that? 
22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remaining. Okay, if I'm Gideon and I'm seeing twice as many people walking away as I am staying with me, I'm thinking, wait a minute, God. Wait a minute. Something's wrong here. God, am I supposed to be going with those guys? Because I can, I can call them. Are those the guys I'm supposed to be going with? Because there's 22,000 and then there's only 10,000 here. Nope. You're supposed to stay right here, Gideon. Right where 10,000 people are. You see, that's why I say one man with God is the majority. See, you may, you may be facing struggles. You may be coming up against all kinds of people. You may be going through some difficulties that, that are beyond your control. But I want you to understand one man with God is the majority. God is saying, hey, I'm strong enough. I'm big enough to uphold you. My, my mighty right hand is big enough to uphold you when you're struggling. In your struggle. So, he just lost 22,000 people. And then the word said again, the people are still too many. Mm. Okay, so then he tells them to take them down to a stream. And he says, These are the, 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 I want you to tell them to get a drink out of the stream. And while they're getting a drink, those who, I'm going to try to do this near this thing right here. Those who get down, and drink like this, send them packing. But those who get down and drink like this, those are the ones you get to keep. <laughs> because you know why? Because they're warriors. They're, they're the ones that are working out. You know, you down like this, you get stabbed in the back and you don't even know it. Right? So, guess how many people Drank like this. <laughs> a whopping 300 out of 10,000. Really? Okay, I don't know. I mean, maybe you all wouldn't respond like, like I would think Gideon would respond, but I'm, I'm thinking, okay, God, let's get serious here. Okay, I'm, I'm going to have to put out another fleece to make sure this is what you're doing. <laughs> Come on. Many of us might be in that position. God, I'm going to have to put out something else. Because, God, you're really, you're really testing this here. You know, I had my hope in you, Jesus, but then you start doing this. You're kind of getting out there now. I'm getting ready to go get some Midianites with 300 people. Do you understand how big this army is? Yeah, God understands. So here they are. 300 men. And it says, on, in verse 9 of chapter 7, it says, It happened on the same night the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. Now listen to this. God, God gives Gideon it out. He says, but if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp to cure it, your servant. And you shall hear what they say, and afterwards your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Now listen, then he went down with cure it. <laughs> okay. If you're afraid, then you can let take cure with it. And then, a verse later, he goes down with cure it. <laughs> I'm afraid, God. I got 300 people behind me, man. I really don't think they're going to do it. But that's all right. Here he goes. To the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. Now the Midianites and the Malachites, all the people of the East, were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts. And their camels were without number as the sand of the seashore in multitude. I want you to really get this in your head. Okay? Do you know what? Some of our problems look this big. Don't they? Some of our problems look this big. And a lot of times, we look like we're fighting with 300 men. We feel like we're fighting with 300 men. And we, we don't, we look around like, oh, man, I, I need something, God. I need something to change this. There's, there's no way that these 300 can, can win. But God is able to defeat our enemies. You believe that? Amen. So, we get down here, and Gideon's getting ready to, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Gideon goes down, and, and he finds out there's this dream. So he gets more confirmation from the Lord. There's this dream, and it talks about this barley bread being tossed into the camp. And 
And then the, the guy, they give, they give an interpretation. Hey, this barley bread represents the, the sword of Gideon. And he's going to destroy the Midianites. I don't know how they got that out there. Hey, you know, that, they're the one interpreting it. That's great. You know, it's a loaf of barley bread. It's the same as the sword of Gideon. And they interpret that. It, it encouraged Gideon. He's like, yeah, yeah, all right. The sword of Gideon, man. We're going to go. We're going to defeat the, the Midianites. Now, this is what I really love. Okay? Gideon comes back to the people, man. He comes back to these 300 men, these men of war, these men that fight with swords and shields. And, man, they're, they're, they're there and they're, they're ready to go. And you know what? Gideon hands out three things. Gideon hands out three things to these men of war. It says, Then he divided 300 men into three companies and put a trumpet in every man's hand, an empty pitcher, and a torch inside the pitcher. Okay, if I'm a mighty man of war and I'm a mighty man of. A bower, I'm, I'm looking down at this and I'm like, and looking, thinking, uh, we're going to hit him with the pitcher and, and uh, light him on fire or what? You know, I mean, what is this, Gideon? And then I'm going to blow my trumpet after I'm done over their dead body? I mean, what is this? But you know what? That's what I love about God. Is he's unconventional. He doesn't do it like we would expect him to do it. He does it completely different. But you know what? Because our expectations and our hope is in the way we think it should be done, we miss God altogether. You know why? Because sometimes He hands us a pitcher, a torch, and a trumpet. And we say, God, I can't use this in this situation. He's saying, oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. I've given you the tools that you can use right now in this situation. Are you going to trust me with those tools? Are you going to believe that I have given you what you need in this moment? Are you going to believe it? So, they said, the Bible says they circle around the camp of the Midianites. They circle around the camp. And they get around the camp. It says, every man stood in his place, verse 21. All around the camp. Okay, well, let's look at verse Twenty-first. It says, then the three company, companies were standing around the camp. They blew their trumpets. They broke the pitchers, and they held the torches in their left hands, and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing. They cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And as soon as they did that, it says that they started fighting against each other. Chaos broke out in their camp, and they started fighting against each other. Hmm. Don't you love it when your enemies... You don't have to fight against them. They start fighting against each other. And God defeats them that way. Now, they started fighting. They, they, uh, they pursued them. They subdued the Midianites. They captured them. Now, I want to, uh, the reason why I wanted to share the story of Gideon is because, because I believe that we can bear witness more with Gideon than we can with a lot of other people. Because we go in and out of places of hope and hopelessness. We go in and out of, of faith and doubt. And we, we, start to, we start to act just like Gideon. And we say, God, if this is really you. God, if, if you have really said this. Lord, if this is really what you want. And God, God, is, God is wanting to, to show us that just as he did for Gideon and just as he will do for us, he, he is there. He is with us. He does walk with us. He, he did not send Gideon in the battle all alone that day. He didn't send him with just 300 men that day. No, he said, I went in with the sword of, of the Lord and of Gideon. So, so it's not that we're just walking in a battle. It's not that we're walking through this life by ourselves. But we're walking through this life with Jesus Christ. And that's where our hope needs to dwell. That's where our hope needs to happen and you know what? We can learn from Gideon. We don't have to be in the same place as Gideon. We don't have to be in that same place of unbelief and struggle. We can have, we can turn our eyes to Jesus in the having the awareness that God is our hope. And I have taken my eyes off. I'm telling you, if you're feeling hopeless today, if you're feeling like you're helpless and there's no way out of your situation, your eyes are not on Jesus right now. Your eyes have gotten onto your circumstances. Your eyes have gotten onto your situation. And you have 
Stop looking at Jesus Christ, the hope that you had as salvation and the hope that you still have today. So we have to, we have to turn our eyes back to Him. We have to turn our eyes back to Him and we say, Lord, the Lord says, find your hope in the fact that I will be with you. Because not only will I defeat your enemies, will, will I overcome your struggles, but you will do it as one man with Him. You will do it. So we see the power of God when, when Gideon chose to trust Him. God defeated the Midianites, just as God said He would, through the hand of Gideon. Psalm chapter 43 and verse 5 says, Why am I so depressed? This is how the psalm starts out. Why am I so depressed? Maybe you, maybe you feel that way today. Why am I so depressed? Why this turmoil within me? And now, this, this psalmist is doing the same thing. He's, he's commanding himself. Put your hope in God. Why am I so depressed? Why all this turmoil? Put your hope in God. If there's chaos going on inside of you, put your hope in God. Tell yourself. Self, it's time to put your hope in God. You put your hope in too many other things for too long. It's time to turn around and put your hope in God. That's where your hope needs to be. And then he says, for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. Is that where your hope is? You're in your Savior and your God? The one who died a painful death upon that cross. The one whom you believed in that died for your sins. That rose from the dead and defeated the grave. Amen. Is that who your hope is in today? Amen. A risen Savior. A living God. A God that is making intercession for us at the right hand of the Father. Is that who your hope is in today? I want you to understand something. Depression and chaos do not belong to the people of God. That's right. Depression and chaos do not belong in the people of God. Hope belongs in the people of God. Hope belongs there. And I know this is a rough world we live in. This is tough. There's, there's horrible things happening all over the place. But we don't blame God for that. We blame Adam. <laughs> right? We blame Eve. <laughs> hey, this world was perfect before they came along. <laughs> right? That's right. Come on. <laughs> Sin entered into this world by one man. But you know what? Jesus came to destroy sin. And if, if you have accepted that sacrifice that he has made, sin has been destroyed in your life. Amen? Amen. But you know what? Sin is still rampant in this world. Amen. And the reason why bad things happen in this world is because sin is present. The enemy has a short time to destroy people. And he's going to do whatever he can to make sure it happens. But remember, sin has been destroyed in your life. So I ask you today, where is your hope? Where is your hope? Proverbs 13, 12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when desire comes, is it a it, when that desire comes, it is a tree of life. You see, hope deferred. That means when hope, when you're hoping and the answer isn't coming, but you only get sick in your heart. You think, it's not coming. It's not coming. My heart's getting sick. Okay, it's not happening. It's not happening. It's not happening. But then listen. But when the desire comes, it's a tree of life. Don't give up. Don't give up. 
just because your hope has been deferred. And, may, and I even want to say that hope displaced makes the heart sick. Hope displaced. Okay? If you are hoping, like I said, in your situation, expecting and, and things that are not God, your heart's going to become sick. Because you're going to be discouraged all the time. Anybody ever been on a roller coaster? Those are fun, physically. They're not spiritually. <laughs> okay? I want you to understand that. But you're telling you, if you put your hope in anything but Christ... You're going to find yourself on a spiritual roller coaster. Going up and down. Up and down. This is how I want my walk to look. Because I've been steadfast and moving. Looking to the Lord for my help, for my hope. I want my life to look like that. Does it always look that way? No, but I want it to look like that. Because I know whom I believe. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. I know who I believe in. It took Gideon a while to fully grasp the concept of putting his full hope in God. How long will it take us? How long will it take us? God is, God is giving you the invitation today. Hey, I am who I say that I am. I can do what I can say that I can do. So will you put your hope in me today? Will you place your hope in me today? <clears throat> Maybe you're here today. And you're in that place. Just like Gideon, where you weren't ready to put your hope in him. Where you, you weren't ready to put your hope in him. Maybe you're here today and you, you just feel like, man, you don't understand. You don't understand, Pastor. I, things just seem to be falling apart. I, I feel so out of control. Good. I want you to understand. It's good. Okay, I'm glad you feel out of control because that's when God can take control. Okay, I'm glad your situation feels out of control because that's when God can swoop in and take control. Okay, when we're, when we're trying to control, God can't have control. Okay, God is saying, let go. Let go and let me take control. And I know many of us are saying, but man, I, I just feel like if I let it go, I feel like I'm not doing anything. Oh, you're doing more than you've ever done for the last month, for the last several months. When you finally let it go and give it to God, because God's going to do with it so much more than you could have ever done with it. You've been, you've been spinning your wheels for the last year, maybe, and God is going to take it. Maybe in a week it's all going to be over. You just don't know. It could be a month. It could be a six months. But I'm telling you, when we give it to God, it's more than we could have ever done in our whole lifetime of trying to do it ourselves. It is time to put our hope in God. It's time to, to place our hope in Him and trust Him and believe Him. Has anybody ever been let down? Come on, you can say it. We've all been let down, right? But I want you to understand, God is never the one. It's let me down. My expectations let me down. Because I expected God to do it a certain way and He didn't. He did it completely different. My idea of the way God's supposed to work let me down. Not God. Maybe you're here today and you're in a place of, of helplessness and hopelessness. You just feel like, man, this is this is hard, but man, I really want to put my hope in Jesus Christ today. I want I want to let go of this this stuff. I want to let go of these things that have been been troubling me, that have been hurting me, that have been holding me down. I want to let go of them today. If that's you, I want you to stand right where you are. You're you're in this place, and you're just saying, you know what, God, I need I need to find that hope that Gideon found. I need to find that hope in Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about maybe we just veered down the path of hopelessness. And we feel helpless right now where we're at. I just want you to stand right where you are. That's where you're at today. Where you feel like, man, I'm just, I'm so discouraged right now, Pastor. I don't know what to do. I still help us in my situation. I want us to understand today that Gideon did not 
be a hope filled and tell him, God with Jesus, no God with the Lord. There's, there's no walk of shame here. There, there's nothing. There's no judgment here. There's nothing but love in this place. You know what? If you, there, if life has been hopeless, that's okay. But I'll, that's why we need hope, right? If life was never hopeless, we wouldn't need hope. Jesus is saying, I'm your hope today. You know where they live. You know the thoughts going through their mind right now, Lord God. You know where they're at, God, in their walk with you. God, you know the feelings, Father God, that they are facing even now. And Lord, I thank you that you have promised us that the Lord goes with us. The Lord, we are not walking this life alone. But Lord, we are walking it with you. Lord, if there's anybody here in this place, Lord God, that is in that place, Lord, where they feel helpless, where they feel like there's no way out, Lord, I pray, God, you give them strength right now to place their hope in you, Jesus. To turn their eyes upon you, Lord. The God... That can do the impossible. The God in whom all things are possible. And Lord, we just pray right now, God, that as we go through this week, as we go through the next few months, and we go as we go through the next several years, God, that we will remember who you are. That we will remember, Lord God, to place our hope in you. When we get discouraged, when we get distraught, God, that we will remember to stop and ask ourselves, where is my hope? Where is my hope today? Lord, help us to constantly and consistently keep our hope in you, Lord. Father, we thank you. I thank you for this, this group of people, Father God. I thank you for this message, Lord. I know you are speaking here today. I give you praise for that. God, let your blessing be upon every single person in this place. Bless them, Lord God. Overtake them with your blessing. And Lord, protect them as they leave this place, Lord God. Use them as they go out to shine the love of Jesus Christ to others. Let them be tools in the Master's hands. And Lord God, as you put tools in their hands, I pray, God, they would not look at them puzzled, but they would take them and they would use them as you have purposed them to use them. Father, we thank you today for all that you're doing, God, in this body and all you're doing in, this, in these lives. For Lord God, your work is so great, we cannot even comprehend it. And Lord God, you're not even halfway done with us yet. And we thank you, God, that you're still working on us today. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.
bless y'all. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord.